Hey everyone. The stories in this video are very dark and disturbing. There will be dark topics briefly mentioned such as sexual assault and murders, although I really did my best to not go too into detail, but these are things that are mentioned. Also, you may have already heard some of these stories before, but I really wanted to do some stories based on the 70s time period. It was a really crazy time back then, lots of serial killers and such, so I thought it would be an interesting topic. Anyways, that's the intro. If you're all ready, let's get into the stories. My mom and her friends spent the day at the beach in Florida. The friend they drove had to go to work, but they stayed and said that they would walk home instead. They were walking back and it was burning hot in the high 90s. A white pickup truck drove past them then slowed down and made a U-turn. He stopped to talk to them. I should preface this with the fact that my mom and her friend were both drop dead gorgeous and wearing bikinis and shorts. They said the truck that stopped was driven by a young man that was very handsome and probably in his late 20s. He offered them a ride. My mom, who was always weary of strange men even back then, said no, but her friend started to whine and then said, Come on, it's hot and we have another mile to go. It will just take a few minutes. My mom still didn't want her to, but her friend climbed in the truck, and my mom didn't want to leave her alone. So she then reluctantly climbed in the front seat with her friend in between her and the man. Her friend was a chatty Kathy, and she talked away to this guy without paying attention to anything around her. My mom had a bad feeling, and she noticed the man still hadn't turned his truck around and was heading out to the dunes where there was nothing but deserted beaches for miles. She looked over, and she realized he had pulled all of his junk out of his pants and was masturbating. My mom instantly became angry and grabbed the door handle and opened the door. She then said, You need to stop this truck right now and let us out, you sick bastard. At the same time, her friend snapped out of it and saw what was going on. She flipped out, and according to my mother, dove straight over her and out of the moving truck. As she jumped out, the man tried to grab her and only got a hold of her bikini top, so it came off. She said she watched as her friend hit the ground and it was like slow motion. The man then began to speed up. My mom was looking at how fast the ground was moving, and he says, You can stay in here with me or you can jump out. You're gonna die either way. And that was enough for my mom. She jumped out and skidded across the road. Her entire left side was road rash from head to toe. She laid on the ground dazed and wondering if she was going to die. Her now topless friend ran over to her screaming, Get up! He's coming! He's coming back! My mom rolled over and looked just in time to see him doing a U-turn and speeding back to finish what he started. Her friend helped her back up and they ran towards the beach. They just happened to jump out right where the lifeguard station was. They were then greeted by lifeguards, many of them their friends who administered first aid. My mom went through months of healing and had a sprained ankle. Her friend was unharmed. Unfortunately, the man was never caught. From the fall of 1973 through the spring of 1977, I attended the School of the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston, Massachusetts. Although I took classes from 9am to 5pm every day, I'd often stay after school until 10 or 11 o'clock at night to do extra work. One evening at around 6.30pm, I went into a small room on the upper floor to do my transcendental meditation session. I was sitting there with my eyes closed meditating, when a guy I'd never seen before crept up behind me, put his hand over my mouth, and said in a nasty, threatening tone of voice, Don't say a word, do you understand? I instinctively screamed at the top of my voice, What the hell are you doing? The guy then fled immediately. Wow, that was a close call. Moreover, it was still light out when it happened. Had I just kept quiet as a mouse, it would have been a really, really bad trip for me, if one gets the drift, especially since school was located in a pretty rough area. Anyways, that's my story, and it really scared the hell out of me. 
On a darn cold night in the late 70s, my dad's truck broke down about an hour away from home. He started walking out and put his thumb out hitchhiking for a ride, and he was soon picked up by a middle-aged man in a brown sedan. My dad gets in the car. Thanks, man. I appreciate the lift. The driver doesn't respond. I'm trying to get further north. Where are you headed? Driver again doesn't respond and begins to drive. Without even a look, the driver locks the doors and puts his hand on my dad's upper thigh and squeezes. My dad was around 24 to 25 years old. He worked in construction, specifically drywall. He wasn't a tall man, but he was barrel-chested and stocky. My dad turns to face him. I'm not into that. I just need a ride. Driver doesn't move his hand. After 10 seconds of silence, Hey man, let me out of the car now! Driver still doesn't respond, doesn't even look at him. My dad grabs the hand and peels it off his thigh. Hey man, let me out of the car! I will kick your ass! Let me out now! My dad was ready to strike at any moment. Without a word, again without even looking at him, the driver pulls over, unlocks the doors, and my dad jumps out. Driver peels off. My dad eventually arrives home and tells everyone what happened. Family doesn't believe him. Well, a few years later, he's dating my mom. They're watching the news, which is covering the arrest of serial killer John Wayne Gacy. My mom said that my dad went pale. My dad jumped out of his chair, shaking violently, and then started screaming and pointing at the TV. That's him! That's the guy who picked me up! My mom said that she believed him immediately. My dad wasn't much of a liar or prankster. He was blunt. He was rather quiet and didn't particularly crave any attention. I was so intrigued by the incident that in the late 90s I had read a few books on Gacy, including the one written based on his interviews. Gacy picked up countless hitchhikers over a multi-year period in the 70s. Sometimes he would pick up hitchhikers and take them wherever they wanted to go without incident. The timeline details, geography, and M.O. were all consistent. My theory is that Gacy picked up my dad thinking he was younger than he was, and then he tested out my dad's reaction. My dad was a bit older than Gacy's target age of 18 to 20. When my dad fought back aggressively and immediately, Gacy figured he wasn't worth the trouble, and possibly also realized that my dad was not as young as he looked. A few years ago, my husband and I were at an event, and we'd started chit-chatting with a couple seated at our table. For some unremembered reason, I told the story. The female half of the couple turned white and stared at me, mouth agape. She said that her uncle has an almost identical Gacy encounter. I'm just so sad for those who were unable to escape. My mother at one time was in the military and dating some dude. They broke up over whatever, but this didn't sit well with him. Since my mom was away, I was being taken care of by my grandparents. The boyfriend somehow got me from school. This was in the late 70s to 80s by the way, so I don't know how lax or strict the rules for taking a child were. Long story short, he took me to the airport. They found me there, but I unfortunately don't know if he left me or was arrested. My mom ended up leaving the military after that, and to be honest, she was never really the same after. I honestly believe if he had got me on that plane, I wouldn't be here today. The story takes place in the late 70s, I assume, as this took place when credit cards were used to open locked doors. My nini lived in South Richmond, Virginia, which was at the time the murder capital of the United States. She worked the night shift as a security guard at a hotel and lived in a new apartment complex in the inner city. She was fresh out of college and she didn't have the income to live anywhere else. She lived on the third floor of said apartment complex. It was unlit and rather dark, even at high noon. Not long after she had gotten home from work one night, she had heard shuffling outside of her door. Thinking it was the wind, she ignored it and sat down to eat dinner before going to sleep. The shuffling started off again, along with a thud on her door. 
She didn't pay a large amount of attention to this and just kept eating. It was then that she had heard a credit card being inserted in the space between her door and the doorframe in an attempt to get into her apartment. She did not ignore this. Grabbing a baseball bat under her couch, she got up and shouted at the wannabe intruder that she was a security guard, and she then warned that she was armed. She expected to hear footsteps heading in the opposite direction. Instead, she had heard a man say, You're going to open this door and I'm going to kill you. She froze as I imagine anybody would, and was silent. The man then chuckled. She didn't open the door, and he didn't try to jimmy the lock anymore, instead banging and scraping on the door until 5 in the morning. My nanny was terrified to leave her apartment, and also terrified to return to it in case that the intruder would still be there. She later went to the manager of the apartment complex, who deferred her to the Richmond police. They said that there had been multiple reports of similar incidents, as well as murders in the area. The culprits were not caught then, but they were later discovered to be the Briley brothers, though she only thought she experienced one culprit at her apartment. Linwood was known to kill one of his own as well as his own brother. This happened to me in the 70s when I was 11 years old. My two brothers and I have always had to walk to and from grade school each day for eight years since they didn't have a bus for our area. This was quite a distance away, and there was no way in current times there wouldn't have been a bus for our grade school days. We were the last house on the right in a very small subdivision on a dead-end street. Next to us was a ginormous cornfield with an old barn and house and had a lot of acres of fruit trees and woods. As a shortcut, I would take this deserted woods trail and follow it to what will lead me to my house after about 15 minutes. That particular day, I turned right into the woods and the trail, as I had did every year for six years by then. It was the end of winter, and I still had my long blue winter coat on. I had walked about five minutes on the trail, and for some reason just happened to look behind me. Quite a distance away, as I walked fast... I saw a man enter the woods and was on the same trail that I was on. No one else was around, and for some reason I had started walking even faster, thinking I was just being silly. When I looked behind me, I saw the man also begin to pick up his pace. This scared me, and I started walking really fast. I saw that he was too when I again glanced over my shoulder. I still don't know why, but that day I felt fear. So I began running, and I noticed he was running too. I was really afraid then, and no longer had the time to glance behind me. I broke into a full run as fast as I could until I came out on the road in front of my house. Normally I walked the trail a bit further and end up at our garage and back door, but that day I sprinted into where our little street on the dead end began, and that brought me right in front of our house. I didn't want him to know I lived there, so at that point I stopped and was catching my breath. He was only maybe 10 to 15 seconds behind me, and he caught up with me, but he didn't stop. As he kept a much slower pace then, he looked at me and then said, You're a fast runner. And then he kept going. I stayed where I was until I couldn't see him anymore. Then I turned into our driveway. Pretty much for months after that, I would take a different way home, and I didn't walk those same trails again for quite some time. I don't know if I was just being paranoid or what, but why else would a young man begin running after me for a good 10 minutes like that? I also want to mention that he looked like he was around 18, so very young. He scared the crap out of me. It's a good thing that I was indeed a very fast runner, or who knows what might have occurred on that deserted woods trail. This is a story of a scary encounter that my dad and uncle had when they were young boys, about 10 and 13 years old in the mid-1970s. Growing up, they moved around a lot because of their dad's work. And in this case, they had just moved to East Malvern, an old suburb with big old houses just outside of Melbourne. Nowadays, East Malvern has beautiful oak line streets and is home to the upper middle class and wealthy young families but at the time it was just run down and plain. 
The two boys had been sent up to the shops to get some groceries for their mom, bread, milk, etc., and the milk bar was just a few blocks away from their house. The two of them were returning at about 5 p.m., and it was August, so it was winter back then, so it was starting to get dark. My uncle happened to look around behind him, and he noticed that a little distance back there was a tall woman pushing a pram. Something about her was strange, and it caught my uncle's attention. He turned around again, and he noticed that the woman was wearing an old-fashioned bonnet and shawl, and the pram was an old-fashioned perambulator style. She was also wearing long white gloves. My uncle thought that maybe she was a poor single mom who had relied on St. Vinny's donations to dress herself and supply the old pram, but she didn't look like the other single mothers he'd seen before. He turned again and was startled, because suddenly the woman was much closer than before, as if she had been running up behind them. It was from that distance that he had noticed what was so strange about the woman. She was unusually tall, yes, but from a closer distance, he saw the broad shoulders, big hands and arms, and the hard jawline of a man. In 1970s Melbourne, any kind of cross-dressing was considered shocking and bizarre to just about everyone. My dad and uncle were afraid. The man was now staring at the two of them with intensity and began speeding up his walking pace. The boys crossed the road and sped up their pace. The man sped up again and started to cross the road with them. At that point, the boys just bolted. After reaching the corner, they had stopped running and looked behind them. The man with the pram was now gone. They stood frozen for a few minutes, staring back, catching their breath, and terrified and unsure of what to do. Minutes later, they continued walking. As they turned the last corner to their street, my dad screamed. He had seen a head with a bonnet peering out from between two parked cars a little way in front of them, between them and their house. At this point, my dad and uncle ran up the driveway to the nearest house. The man started following them again. My uncle stood with his finger hovering over the doorbell staring at the man who was now standing at the bottom of the driveway. At that point, my uncle who was terrified rang the bell, causing the man to immediately run away. The police got involved, but they never found anyone, and luckily nothing ever happened again. The blocks in East Malvern are divided by small alleyways that run behind the houses into their garages on the block and so the man had doubled back around through the alley behind their house and was waiting to ambush them. I'm really glad they managed to get away unscathed. This was a very long time ago, back in 1973. I know it was summer, I was six years old and we were living on Monica Lane in Madison, Wisconsin. The thing is, I sort of recalled it but never put two and two together until a few months ago when I was talking to my mom who went into great detail. I was a very gregarious child, outgoing, extroverted, and friends with anyone. It was at the time a middle class neighborhood, and three houses down from ours on the same side of the street was a huge park. My mom was a nurse and my dad was a salesman but my mom worked second shift at Meritor while my dad worked days. I rarely ever had a babysitter, only if they went out for dinner or a movie. But they did go out often, and there were always older kids in the neighborhood to babysit. One sitter who I really liked lived a few blocks or so away and down the street a little bit. Her name was Vicky. Vicky had babysat a few times before that, and it was pretty uneventful. She'd play games with me, do my hair, play dress up, you know, pretty basic stuff. So anyhow, one day I had gone with friends down to the park. I remember there was a ball field at the time, and a sandlot next to the field. My friends wanted to play in the monkey bars, but I wanted to play in the sand. I looked at the sandbox, and my babysitter Vicky was standing there. I told my friends I was going to go down to the sandbox, and then ran off. We played in the sand building a castle, and then she asked me if I wanted to go get something cold to drink. Now, it was stiflingly hot, and I of course said yes. She takes my hand and we start walking to her place. She starts telling me about her puppies and asking if I want to play with them. Of course, I got giddy, and I couldn't wait to get to her house. This was where my memory had stopped, 
and after my mom told me what happened, the rest of it all flooded back. My mother just so happened to be talking to my sister and I about some of the places we lived at, and we got to Monica Lane. I told her that I remembered the park and how big it seemed, and she asked me if I remembered being kidnapped. I pretty much immediately thought she was kidding, and then the look on her face told me otherwise. She said it was around 5 in the afternoon, and one of my friends had come to the door to ask me to come back outside, sure that I had gotten bored and walked back home. When my mom checked the house, she realized that I wasn't there, and she was also 7 months pregnant with my sister. She then sprinted to the park, screaming my name. After asking several kids if they'd seen me with no clue, she went to the ball field and asked the older boys if they'd seen me. One of the boys, she'd guessed around 14, said that he'd seen a younger woman playing with a girl that fit my description in the sand and walked off in a general direction, and that was all he knew. My mom ran across the street to one of the houses and had asked to use their phone, then called the police. By the time the police got there, my dad had come home and some of the neighbors were trying to help my mom. So there's now this search party out looking for me, screaming my name and knocking on doors. The police had gone back to the park to ask the boys if they knew who had been with me and if they knew who she was. Between the boys and the neighbors, they deduced who it was that had led me off, but I have no idea how honestly. The police and the entourage go to her home. She lived with her parents, but they weren't home, and they knocked on the door. She came to the door and told them that she hadn't seen me, and that she'd been home all day. The police asked to come in, and for some reason she said okay. They went through the house and then went to the basement, and that's when they found me. That's what my mom knew, and then I remembered. It was literally like a floodgate had opened, and I started crying. At six years old, you sort of just trust everyone, and she'd been in our home. I never got a bad feeling from her, and my parents didn't either. But when we walked into her house, I remember that cold, holy crap feeling washing over me and getting very worried. I remember starting to cry and saying I wanted to go home over and over. She takes me into her kitchen and gets me a glass of water and a tissue. I hear dogs barking and next to the kitchen is an open stairway that goes down and where the barking was coming from. She starts trying to cajole me into going downstairs, telling me there's all sorts of toys and games. I reluctantly agree, and she grabs my hand to head down the stairs. The dogs are going nuttier, and I start screaming. At this point, Vicky's getting really bizarre. She then starts screaming at me. Shut the hell up! If you don't shut up, I will throw you in the cage with the dogs and they'll eat you. Now shut up! Dragging me down the stairs and still screaming. I was scared out of my mind. I remember crying so hard I was hyperventilating, and I'm screaming so hard that I'm not making sounds. Vicky then flips a switch and starts being syrupy sweet, trying to calm me down. She tells me that she was just playing a game, and she tells me that she wants to play hide and seek with me. She must have been relatively skilled at calming me down, because the next thing I know I hear knocking on the door upstairs and I wasn't crying. The houses were all the same sort of tract houses that Sears used to sell. Not huge, but not small, but you could hear everything at any spot in the house. I keep hearing the knocking, and she tells me that it's her friends. They're coming to play hide and seek too. She convinced me to let her put a piece of masking tape over my mouth so I wouldn't make a sound and she then lifted me into this big wooden box next to the kennel. She then put a big pile of blankets over me and told me to be really quiet so they didn't find me. The whole time the dogs were going crazy, but when she calmed me down, they calmed down too. They still looked incredibly mean, but they were no longer frothing at the mouth and only slightly growling now until the knocking started. I remember scrunching in there confused still scared and convinced that the dogs were going to get out and eat me. I was crying again and hyperventilating. I remember taking the tape off my mouth because I couldn't breathe, but I remember that I needed to be quiet because I was afraid of what she'd do if I screamed. I laid in that smelly box next to a big bag of dog food sweating to hell, tears rolling down my face. I sort of pushed the blankets to the side 
but only enough so that I could pull them back over me when someone came. I recall thinking about my dad and wondering if he'd come to find me. All of a sudden, I hear what sounds like adults yelling my name. They all come down the stairs, and the dogs are going crazy again. Over and over, men are yelling my name, and then I hear a man then say, If you don't shut those damn dogs up, I will! I was in a large storage box with tape hanging off my mouth when they opened the lid. I remember a very nice man asking me my name and if I was okay. I don't remember answering him in anything other than screams and tears, and grabbing his neck so hard my dad had to practically pry me off of him. I remember my parents taking me to the hospital to be checked out, and that's all I really remember. My mom said that Vicky was found guilty of attempted kidnapping, and last she knew she was in prison but couldn't remember when the last time she heard anything about her. We moved from the area shortly thereafter, and I haven't been back since. I do know that mom said that her parents were odd, but they didn't know them. She had met Vicky from neighbors that had used her as a babysitter, and had never heard of anything bad, and that I always seemed happy with her. She lived in the general neighborhood, but it would have been two blocks over and one block down. My mom said that they never picked her up, she always walked over. When they'd get home, they'd drive her home, but they never noticed anything out of the ordinary about her. My mom and dad had only met her parents when they came to the door to ask for forgiveness, that Vicky hadn't meant to do anything bad, and she was a good girl. My mom said that my dad picked her dad up by the shirt and told him that if they ever come to our property again, he'd kill them. I remember her name and sort of what she looked like, but I would have no idea if she walked up to me who she is. So this isn't my story, but my dad's. He only told me about it briefly, so apologies for the lack of immense detail. In 1975, my dad was 11 years old and living in Leeds with his mother and stepfather, and for some pocket money he would do paper round every morning extremely early. He left the house in the dark, being October, and as usual went to collect the papers, setting off to take his usual route through some playing fields. Essentially a public park, but not a very well kept one. Well, this morning in question was a particularly dark and gloomy one and as he approached the cut through he usually took. There seemed to be something off about it, so much so that it genuinely freaked him out just to be there. He decided to take his time and go the long way around, just to avoid the park, and thought nothing of it for the rest of the morning. Well, when he got to school after his paper round, everyone was freaked out and in a quiet state. Well, upon asking his friends what was going on, they told him that a woman had been murdered with a hammer and stabbed in the neck earlier that morning in the same playing fields that he decided not to go through, and on the same pathway too. It's probably just a major coincidence, but a very lucky one at that, because the time he was on his round was the apparent time the crime was happening. This turned out to be the first of 13 gruesome murders committed by the notorious Peter Sutcliffe, aka the Yorkshire Ripper. This happened to my father in 1975 in a little country bumpkin town when he was 7 years old and his sister was 9. I'll be typing this out as he recounts what happened. My father was a truck driver who had to be up at 2am every morning. That meant that we had a rule in our house that no matter what, you can't wake up dad when he goes to bed at 7pm. My mother worked in an old folks home until about 10pm every night. So for a couple of hours, it was just me and my sister in the house all by ourselves. It was our bedtime one night, so my sister and I went to bed. In a couple of minutes, I had heard something hitting the side of the house. Then it started hitting my window. It was really weird, so I got my sister to come into my room. We looked out the window and saw a man bouncing one of my toys against the window and catching it. He put his hand to his mouth and motioned for us to be quiet. Then he motioned for us to go outside and play with him. We were frozen in fear. Then he started walking away and we couldn't see him out the window anymore. We ran to the kitchen, and there he was motioning for us to open the sliding door. 
We knew that we couldn't wake up our dad, so we then ran and hid in the living room. The man then walked to our front door and started whispering something that we couldn't understand, as well as making scratching noises. All we could do was cry and remain paralyzed. We saw car lights approaching the house. It was my mother returning home from work. We watched as the man ran off the porch and hid behind my father's truck. We watched the man smile and wait until our mother got out of the car. She got out, opened the trunk, got her belongings, and walked up on the porch. I'm embarrassed to say that we were too scared to open the door and warn her. All we could do was watch as the man sneakily tiptoed behind her. She opened the front door and shut it behind her. She saw us hiding, and just as she was about to yell at us for being up so late, she then saw our fear-stricken eyes glued to the glass in the front door. She turned around and saw his face pressed against the glass and him jiggling the doorknob. She screamed and put all of her weight against the door, locked the door, then called my grandfather who just lived a street over. The man then shouted profanities about how he was going to rape her children right in front of her. She then called the police and told them as well. The next thing we know, my grandfather is speeding up the driveway with his gun out the window just firing it randomly. The cops pulled up just as the man took off into the woods. They saw his back, but that was it. They chased through the woods with dogs and had the whole squad out searching. Other officers inspected the house and saw multiple scratch marks at our doors as well as the side of the house. Apparently he tried to break in and couldn't, so he tried to lure us into letting him in. They never found out who it was and that was the last time we ever saw of them. We were all pretty traumatized for a while, but it didn't bother our dad one bit. In fact, he didn't wake up the entire time. The story is about an event that happened to my mother around 1972 when she was 8 years old. She's told me about it since I was young, and she truly thinks about it and is still affected to this day. To set the scene, both of my grandparents ran a restaurant and gas station in our hometown. They have always ran a business of some type since the 50s. This meant that a lot of days my mom would have to take the school bus home and stay by herself if my grandma had to stay and help run things, but usually no more than an hour or two. My uncle, her older brother, would usually come home on the bus with her, but he was a little older and sometimes he had football practice. So was the case on the day of the event I'm getting to. So my mother arrived home on this day, let herself in the house, and put away her things. She had just recently received a new puppy, and knew the first thing that she needed to do was take the pup out to the yard to use the restroom. She wrapped the dog in a white towel and walked him outside. As she had put down the dog, she shook its hair out of the blanket, flowing it about the wind. It was then she noticed the neighbor's son was staring at her from across the street. This guy was in his late 20s, and he was known to be very strange and mentally ill. Though in the country, mental illness seems to not always be recognized. He would do psycho things like abusing animals, really sick things that I don't want to get into the details. My mom said that he always creeped her and everyone else out. She said he would stare at her when she would play outside, and he made her feel generally uncomfortable. She said that he appeared out of nowhere in his yard that day, and as she shook out the blanket, he began grinning and waving. Feeling more than a little shock, she picked up her pup, went inside, and locked the door. She began to do some homework, and after about five minutes of work, she heard a loud knock at the door. She slowly walked to the window to see who it was. She knew it wasn't my grandparents because of course they had their keys. As she opened the blinds, her eyes locked with those of the creep from across the street, like he was already looking in the window. She jumped and she said she screamed a little as she shut the blinds. She then walked to the door and made sure it was locked. She said that he just continued with a slow continuous thud on the door, almost in a rhythm. Then she really got terrified as he began to speak to her through the door. Hi, sweetie. I saw you with your doggy. Let me in to see him. She was in shock. Come on, let me in, sweetie. Please. I want to see your puppy. In full freak-out mode, my mom screamed. 
You need to leave now. You need to go back to your house. I don't know you. But he just kept knocking. I can really imagine the fear in my mom's eyes when she describes that part, and it gives my whole body chills. He then said, Damn it, let me in. I saw you waving your flag of surrender. I kid you not. The guy thought my mom shaking her hair from the blanket was a flag of surrender and a sign for him to come over. My mom then screamed, I'm calling my dad and the police if you don't leave now. With this, the knocking stopped. She tried to catch her breath and shake off her fear. She then got up from the door and ran to the basement level of the home. It was an old house, so the kitchen and rec room was down there along with the only phone in the house. She made it to the phone and began to dial 911. All of a sudden, she had heard a shatter from the next room. She looked over to see the crazed neighbor attempting to crawl through the kitchen window. He was ripping down the curtain as his upper body got through the window, and my mother screamed what was happening to the police on the phone. All of a sudden, he was bleeding from the abdomen where the window glass had cut him, as his lower half couldn't squeeze through. Then my mom began hearing my grandmother scream, What the hell are you doing? Then the guy yelled in pain and was squirming out of the window as she hit him from behind with some tool that was laying in her garden on the side of the house where the entrance to the window was. He managed to get out of the window and bolted to his house. The police came. My grandma called my grandfather, and he arrived as well after shutting down the business as soon as she told him. They arrested the man for breaking and entering, and something else I believe that was unrelated. On the day of his court date, he told them the white flag of surrender story, but this was the final nut on his crazy cake, as they then put him in a mental institution that very day. He may have gotten out, but I know he eventually went back because my mother said that he later died in an institution. Outside the courthouse, the crazy Appalachian redneck family of the creep tried to blame my eight-year-old mother, and the man's father called my mother a harlot. Needles to say, my army-trained grandpa beat the guy's ass on the courthouse steps as the local cops turned a blind eye. That story has always stuck with me. My mom had to receive therapy for it, so it haunts her a lot even to this day. We always can't help but wonder, though. What would he have done to her if my grandma didn't come home at that moment? So I was telling my mom how I spend my workday reading about creepy stranger encounters and whatnot, and she told me that she had a pretty chilling one herself, so I figured it was creepy enough to share. A little background. My parents both lived in New York for the majority of their teenage and young adult lives, and they were pretty big into the disco scene in the mid-70s, and would go to one almost every other night once they started dating. They also actually met at one. Now, this was around the time when the Son of Sam was prevalent in New York. For those that don't know who that is, he was a serial killer who had killed a few women and some couples. Anyway, one night they decided to walk home instead of taking a cab because they figured it was such a nice night out and the street still had a few clubbers walking around, so they'd rather not spend the extra money. From what my mom says, they were aware of the killer going around, you know, killing people, but they were pretty young and dumb, and just figured, well, this couldn't happen to us, so they thought nothing when a random guy started walking behind them. At first, they weren't creeped out or anything, thinking it was just someone who was headed home too. He was walking pretty fast and seemed to be talking to himself and fumbling around with something in his hand. Still... They weren't alarmed because they figured he had come out of a club and was probably just drunk or high on something. That is, until he got a little closer, and they were able to make out what he had been saying to himself. I need to shoot someone. I just want to shoot someone. At this point, my parents were on high alert and started walking faster, just trying to make it home. But the guy was following them the entire time. They then realized what he had in his hand. You guessed it. A gun. They kept on power walking because he was clearly unstable, and they were afraid that if they started running or made any sudden movements, he would start shooting. Since he was still following them, they decided to cross the street and turn back into another club where there would be security and a shitload of people. You know, instead of just letting him follow them to my mom's house. 
The minute they got close to the club, he then turned into an alley and disappeared. They told security who checked out the alley in the surrounding area, but he was long gone by that point. After getting home, my mom was convinced that it was Son of Sam who was following them, but when he was then caught like a year later, she said that it wasn't him. So yeah, it was just some crazy guy walking around with a gun wanting to shoot someone. This happened to my mom, but it really creeps me out to think about. It happened back in the 70s when my mom was about 20. One night, my mom was at a gas station with a friend visiting her friend's brother Mike who worked there. They stayed and hung out for a little bit before my mom decided to leave, so she got in her car and headed home for the night. Not soon after she pulled out though, she had noticed a car following pretty closely behind her. At first, she thought nothing of it, and she just kept going. But as she kept driving, the car continued to follow her. There weren't very many other cars on the road that night, and my mom lived in a semi-rural area with a ton of neighborhoods or houses nearby. So it started to seem a little weird that this one car would be following so closely behind her for that long of a time. Something felt off. Finally, she turned down her street, which was pretty secluded, and only had a handful of other houses on it. The car turned as well. Something definitely wasn't right. She lived in an old house at the end of a long driveway with a lot of trees, so the area was nearly pitch black at night. There was no way she could get out of her car and into her house with the car still behind her. The only thing she could think to do was turn around and drive back to the gas station where she had just come from, where she knew Mike would still be. The car followed her all the way back. When she turned into the gas station though, only then did she see the car drive away. She then ran inside and told Mike what had happened. She stayed there until the end of his shift and he drove her home. What makes this even more unsettling, though, is that about a year later, a man was arrested for murdering five young women right around the area where my mom lived. To this day, she can't help but think that it was him following her that night, and she wonders what could have happened had she tried to get out of her car and gone into her house. One of the creepiest events in my own experience that I can recall happened when I was about 9 years old, late 1978 or early 1979 if I'm not mistaken, which would have put me in the 4th grade at the time. Just a bit of background information on my school here. It was a newer school for my district at the time, and I guess as an experiment in innovative architecture the school had no square angles in the walls at all. Rather, for simplicity's sake, imagine a U-shape where the opening of the U faces into the parking lot, but where there were hexagons attached to the outer edge of the U. Each of those hexagons was called a pod, and each pod was divided into six classrooms and one central area for the pod, from which a person could see into any one of the six classrooms at one time. The playground was the entire area outside the U-shaped collection of pods, first being blacktop, and then further around grassy field. Critically, this meant that if you were very close to the pods, it was possible for someone else also close to the pods to be within 20 feet of you and still be hidden around the bend of the wall. So on this day in 1978 or 79, my school had an open house and parent-teacher conferences. This was when parents were welcome to come to the school and talk with one another, and especially with their children's teachers and to see how their child or children were performing in school. My mom never missed one of these, and this day was no exception. We went to the school and saw all the teachers and kids and parents gathered in the cafeteria. After whatever general address the principal had to make, everyone went their separate ways to meet one-on-one. -on -one. My mom had teachers to meet for two children, for me and my older brother who was one year ahead of me. When we met my teacher, Miss H, my mom brought my brother and I into the classroom. She apparently had good things to say about me, and we were done quickly. But when we met my older brother's teacher, Mr. C, for some reason my mom told me to go out on the playground and play. My brother remained in the classroom with my mom and his teacher. It was still light outside, so it all seemed okay. However, by this time an hour or more had probably passed since the principal's speech had ended. 
Any parents who had only attended for that or who only wanted to meet a single teacher briefly had done so by now and left. The playground area was devoid of people. The naive little boy that I was, I just walked around the pods like I was in my own house and I stayed close to the outer wall of the pods for no real reason. All of a sudden, without hearing or seeing anything to prepare me for what was about to happen, I was pinched across the back of my neck very hard. The hand that held me seemed too strong for me to break away, and I didn't even have time to try before a voice whispered in my ear to stay still and to not turn around. I nodded as best as I could. Then the voice told me to walk, and it led me around the pod to within the side of the parking lot where a few cars remained. The voice asked me if I saw the green car, the station wagon with the wood paneling on it. I did and indicated so. The voice then told me, Walk to that car, get inside and wait there. Do not turn around. I'll be right behind you. And if you turn around, I'll know you did it. Do you understand me? All the while, the owner of the hand and of the harsh whisper squeezed my neck harder at intervals to add emphasis to certain points. The person then sent me walking to that car. I think I know how the condemned dead man walking must feel. I was a naive boy, but not so naive as to believe getting in that car was a good idea. On the other hand, I felt sure that turning around meant certain death if the owner of that voice was really still there. I had gotten halfway to the car when I wound up freezing, unsure of what to do. I stood there crying, which was already an improvement over the extremity of fear that preceded it. I don't know if I stood there seconds or minutes, but eventually I turned around. Nobody was there. I figured they were back around the pond peeking and waiting, but my mom was that direction also. So I swung way out into the playfield area and walked carefully back around. Somewhere near where I was originally pinched were two boys a year ahead of me, my older brother's age playing marbles. Roger and another boy whose name I never knew. I avoided them, feeling sure they were probably the ones who had pinched me, but I'm sure at some point they noticed me passing them at a distance. They did not react at all. In fact, my brother talked about Roger much later, by chance in terms that he caused me to believe he was a nice guy. Probably as importantly, later reflection led me to consider the whispered voice and the powerful hand to most likely to have belonged to an adult male, not a fellow child. But why did that fool want me in Mr. C's car? Mr. C was in a conference room with my mom, so it was not his doing. My only other guess was my third grade teacher, Mr. S, who had once grabbed me violently when I got up from my chair in class without permission while he was in a bad mood. That dude was actually eventually arrested in 1980 on suspicion of having molested four boys earlier the same year, just a year after my traumatic experience on the playground. I'll never know for sure though, but I will always wonder who it was. My mother recently told me how she was almost raped and possibly murdered by Mike the Mall Passer de Barbeleben. He was a serial rapist, murderer, and counterfeit money passer, and sexual sadist. She told me recently that in 1979, while she was in college in North Carolina, she noticed someone following her in a big car as she walked home one night from class. She tried to ignore it at first, but when it was obvious that she was being stalked, she got scared. She saw a cop car parked at a gas station and ran to it, and the car that had been following her peeled off. Once she thought she was safe, she continued her walk home. Everything was okay until she had to cross the little footbridge that was on her way home. Once she was over it, the same car ripped around the corner and stopped her, and a man rolled down his window and started small talk, and he asked her if he could give her a ride. She said no and started to run, at which point he grabbed her and tried to pull her into the car. She said that she jerked away and immediately ran to a house that was across the street, and he sped away. Two weeks later, she awoke to the sound of her roommate screaming. Mom and three other girls all shared a two-bedroom apartment, so it was two to her room. When she gained her vision, she saw the same guy standing in the middle of her room looking at her. She said that the look on his face was calculating. The roommate screamed, Who are you and what the hell are you doing here? 
and he turned and replied, Uh, I forgot my guitar, and then grabbed a guitar that was leaning on the wall. The roommate then shouted, That's my guitar! And he threw it on the ground and then ran out. After reporting this event to the apartment manager, the manager told my mom that some guy had come by a few days earlier stating that he was a family friend of the pretty girl with long dark hair that lives upstairs and how he wanted to surprise her. So the apartment manager gave him pretty much every detail about my mom, where she works, goes to school, basic weekly routines. Of course, my mom flipped out on her as anyone would. That was the last time she ever saw or heard of him until several years later. She was reading a book about notorious serial killers in America, and she read the story of Mike de Barbalaben, who was all over the country raping and apparently killing some of his victims. When she flipped the page and saw his picture, she gasped. It was him. They also showed a picture of the car, and it was the same one that followed her that night. Once she told me, I started to research. I found this page that showed that he was in the North Carolina area at the same time my mom was attending college there. Also, the victimology shows that he targeted women around the age of 18 and 19, my mom's age at the time. I seriously got the creeps. He died in 2011. I wouldn't be here today if he had done what he was planning to do. I'm really glad he dropped his pursuit. But I wonder more often than I should. Why? I can only assume that his initial plan failed, and it would have been too easy to tie him to any crime committed against my mother at that point, so it was just easier to move on. His next victim was Lori Jensen. She survived, but not before going through major hell. Who knows where she is now, but for some reason I just can't get her out of my head. Hey everyone, I hope you all enjoyed these stories. If you ever want to submit your own, you can do so at southerncannibal.com. Have a good night, everyone. And remember, to always, stay.